Key car. This is in the this is in the late late 90s, early 2000s. Um, it was a turnkey car. They took the engine out of it, and I stuck my big block out of the S10 in it, and immediately picked up two tenths. Went 501 on the first run. And back then, for a street car with power windows, that was fast. So we wore everybody out for about a year. Then it got to where we couldn't get any more races. Uh, you know, we kept going along a couple years, grudge racing here and there, and basically. I look back at it as I was in college, you know, it, it was a time in my life where if you look back at it, you're like, gosh, we were dumb and, and we waste a lot of money. But the experience that you learn having to do, having to go that fast with nothing, it benefits us today. When there's a problem at the racetrack, there are very few people that can fix it faster or better, you know, as far as diagnosing it. I've just seen everything tear up uh, that can possibly tear up. Todd Tuttero said it best. I told him one time, first time I met Todd Tuttero, he came and he fixed a problem that I had had with my race car for, for like two years. He fixed it in five seconds. And I told Todd, I said, you are like the smartest human being I've ever met. And he said, nope, I've just screwed it up every way you can screw it up. So that's, that's really what drag racing is. But first Mustang, uh, got fast, got where we couldn't get any more races, so we decided to go class racing. Um, put, a, put a supercharger on this thing. It took like every quarter I had. I'm talking about pawn shop everything I had, bought a Pro Charger, bought a F3, actually started out with an F2, uh, running, running Easy Street, and uh, put this deal on there in late 2007, 2008, we showed up at the first race uh, for Orska Easy Street. I remember pulling into the gate in Huntsville, Alabama, and absolutely being blown away. I mean, it, I had never been to a race like that. Orska in the, in the late 2000s was as big as NHRA is now. I mean, it is. there was people you couldn't get in. I mean, it was huge. Uh, as far as 8th Mile Door Slammer, it was the mecca. It was the pinnacle, especially in the South. It was the height of the Outlaw 10.5 era, and Outlaw 10.5 was sweeping the country. Uh, and that's when small tire bug bit me. Um, we showed up for that deal completely unprepared as you could possibly be. Um, I'll never forget. We started, we started that thing the day before the race, or two days before the race. We drive all night to get there. I had an enclosed, like, 24-foot trailer with nothing in it but like a Craftsman hand toolbox. I had like a pair, of, like a pair of pliers and some screwdrivers and a couple sockets. Like that's it. We had no floor jack. We had nothing. We had to juggle race fuel and back hurt. So we get there. And a, a buddy of mine that ran Orska was really friends with a prominent crew chief at the time. And he had talked to him, evidently. The crew chief was going to uh, uh, help us out. He was going to show us. I had knew nothing about fuel injection, knew nothing about superchargers, knew nothing about anything as far as that deal. Uh, I had never ran an EFI car before. So we kind of went on the promise that this guy was going to help us get, get it sorted out, get a base map in it. Of course, I didn't have any money to pay him. So we get there, and the guy just shashed me. Uh, leaves me hanging, won't, won't help us. And that's the first time I ever really got mocked in racing. And uh, I like it. Like it, it, it puts a fire in me that's still burning. And we're, we're in staging lanes getting ready to draw for first round. And I remember all them guys laughing at me because my car wouldn't run. I mean, it literally would not idle enough to do a burnout. Like it, it was funny. It was, when I look back, it's not even embarrassment. It was just, I was embarrassed that we were that unprepared. So we got smashed in the first round, and the guy that smashed me in the first round talked a bunch of trash to me and stuff. And I was like, all right. We left that race. I sold everything I had, and we tested five days a week for a month before the next one. And when we showed up for the second race of the season in Jackson, South Carolina, we qualified number one, set the record, and destroyed the field by a tenth. We won every race the rest of that season and won a championship. And in my speech in the banquet, I was a little obnoxious. I told him, I said, you and you and you and you cause this. 
And uh, that's kind of where that's where that's where kind of Stevie Fast really began. I, I realized that hey, I'm good at this, and um, I've got a talent for making these things run good. And I've always believed and told other people and, and, and pushed that if you're passionate about something, if you have a talent, and you're willing to work hard at it, you can find a way to make a living at it. Um, you know, right around that time, I got in the tool business. Uh, we had a, a, a guy that come and sold tools to us at the dealership, Charlie Goen. Um, he, uh, he'd stop by every week and he likes cars too and restores cars. So me and him kind of hit it off and he'd tell me about his Malibu or his cars restoring. And I'd tell him about my piece of crap car that we were racing and he'd laugh at me and I'd laugh at him. And one day he asked me, he said, Hey, you want to, you want to do this? You know, you got kind of a natural gift to gab. You ought to try selling tools. I had no money and really no credit, but for some reason, the bank financed me to get in the tool business. I had to put my house at the time and everything I had under a blanket uh, lien, but got going in the tool business, and man, I did good. Um, so I had a, had a tool truck, Matco franchise. I was top 200 my first year, and uh, it what that did is it, A, allowed me, it opened the doors to different businesses in our community, and it put a little money in my pocket. And as I've always done, when there's money in my pocket, that means there's more parts at the shop. So that, the tool business is where my kind of professional career sprang from. Uh, I was really good at it, did it for, for several years and made enough money to start getting better cars and more motors and stuff. That kind of led to me building the, the third orange car. Everybody's got the misconception that the orange Mustang uh, that we had the Procharger in, that there was one of them. There was actually three of them. The first one, I crashed and flipped over doing a wheel stand uh, for a $500 grudge race at Jackson. Um, the second one, we crashed it too in Orlando and uh, I forget where else I crashed it. The third one is the one that I had built. The third one's the one that we built from scratch that set all the records that kind of started. I don't want to say it started the drag radio movement because there were guys that were doing it. It was popular before I started doing it, but it really... It really helped push it into the spotlight. 2008-9, Phil Schuler had uh, kind of been paying attention. It, it's funny that a crew chief on a top fuel car would pay attention to a small tire racer, but he'd been watching what was going on in Orska and watching how I was dominating that deal. And uh, one day out of the blue, I get a text message, and it's from Phil. And, uh, you know, he would just... Our, our relationship began with him just kind of keeping up what I was doing. I, I had no... Uh, didn't know Phil. I'd seen Phil grudge race a lot before. His name in grudge racing was a household name, mostly surrounded by big money grudge racers, which were out of my league at the time. But, you know, our friendship kind of become a, me asking how he's doing on the top fuel deal and him uh, kind of asking how I was doing on the radio deal. Um, before long, uh, I had got a call from Phil. He said, I'm going to be in Orangeburg this Saturday. I was like, well, I'm going to be in Orangeburg running a race with an orange car. He's like, well, all right, why don't you come over and say, hey, uh, so I go over there and he said, sit in, this, sit in my car and see if you fit, see if you reach pedals. The guy that drove the, the car at the time was about seven foot tall. So I get in this thing and I don't know how the guy that used to drive it drove it, but it fit me like a glove. Uh, and uh, next thing you know, he's asking me if I want to make a lap in it. Uh, and we did and it was the fastest thing I had drove at the time. And uh, immediately I caught it on fire and burned it to the ground and almost crashed it a couple times. And why he continued to let me drive that thing, I have no idea. Um, I guess Phil saw something in me at an earlier age than what I saw in myself, but he continued to help me cultivate my driving talent. And, uh, you know, it, me and him make a pretty good team. And that kind of wraps up, uh, you know, the majority of the 2000s.